Welcome to Classroom 5.0, a podcast that uncovers industry insights, cutting-edge research and practical evidence-based strategies that help us all to imagine and design learning environments and pathways for this ever-evolving world so that together we can best support the next gen to uncover and deliver their unique potential. This episode has been recorded from our hometown of Port Macquarie, which we're grateful to share and enjoy alongside the traditional owners of Beer Pie Country, whose ongoing cultures and connections to lands and waters we celebrate, and whose elders, past, present and emerging, we pay our respect to. I'm your host, Marianne Power, and I am just tickled pink to have my dear friend Anna Shepard joining us today. Uh, We did have a bit of banter before we jumped online. She said, don't worry about the formal bio. Just introduce me as your bestie. And yes, Anna, I am going to introduce you as one of my besties. Uh... And for those who don't know Anna, here's a little bit of the formal stuff, but you'll find her all over social media and in our episode page too. So trust me, there's more than this. But Anna's storytelling is relatable. That's in her bio, and I personally agree. So I'm going to emphasize that point. (laughs) She's down to earth and fun. You'll find out more about that today. And she is a real powerhouse who's optimistic and engaging. Anna uses the power of her own heartwarming and inspirational story. 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 That's good. I'm really not doing so well with this one. It's stormy. (laughs) And her stormy story. Her stormy story. Do you know what? We're going to ditch the bio. If you want to check out what Anna's doing, you need to head over to bambudagroup.com because that is where all of the magic happens and you're going to get a little bit of it today. Basically, she's a powerhouse that's worked across charities, across NGOs, and she's now using everything she's learned in kindness and leadership to teach others how to create a kinder world. So you can just... Put that one in your bio bag, Anna. I will. I'll put that in my pocket. I'll put that in my pipe and smirk it later. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for your 20 words or or less version. It's so good to have you here, my friend. Thanks, And I have to say, this this is one of our first um, attempts at a raw and unearthed (laughs) episode. So if you're listening today, it's a little bit different to what we would normally do. Yeah, we're just winging it. We're just winging it. Winging it. So... but, you know, that's how you and I roll, really. So I just thought it would be appropriate for us to jump in and wing it. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to be here and slightly nervous because you're, like, quite intelligent <laughs> and you might steamroll me out of the studio. So, like, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready for whatever you've got for me, Miles, whatever comes out of that magical mystery mind of yours. Oh, my friend. Well, look, I am going to put a bit of a disclosure at the top and say that if you're listening with little people in your car, perhaps grab your earphones because Anna and I have been known to go all over the place when it comes to talking about Mm. kindness and where we need to go in the future of learning, education and leadership where you and I have collided in the past. Um, So, yeah, we're going to we're going to get real today. I want to speak to you first and foremost about a concept of otherness. But before I get there, could you give a people a little bit of a background of your story and what you led you in because I know of course as part from being my bestie the queen of kindness but what led you into creating Bambuda what's what's your <coughs> purpose behind it Q dog yeah the, do- the dog knew I was coming on so he was like here she goes, here she goes. <laughs> he, he was like I'll do the buyer if you're not going to do it properly thanks mum um, so, so my story actually is quite unique in a sense. You might not know it by first looking at me, but I grew up on the northeast coast of England, as you can probably tell by my very strong Game of Thrones accent. Um, I'm from a little fishing town called Scarborough, which I'm assuming might be the original town that a lot of the other Scarboroughs are named after. Um, and I grew up in caravan parks, actually, on the northeast coast. Um, which were like tourist holiday parks, a little bit like the Australian Big Four holiday parks, except it's always raining and the weather's miserable in the UK. So apart from for about two weeks of the year. So I um, we had these big entertainment complexes in the middle of these parks. So every day for me growing up was lights and colour and performance and music and circus travellers. And I could unicycle by six and juggle by two. And, you know, it was it was really really quite um phenomenal and i'd met thousands of people from a really young age because of living in this environment and i'm one of five girls and three of my sisters well several of my sisters have got i've got um different different disabilities one of my sisters got cerebral palsy um one of my sisters has got marfan syndrome which is a connective tissue disorder i kind of spent the majority of my childhood rugby tackling kids to the ground 
um, because if they weren't giving us a hard time because we were these kids from the caravan park, it was because we didn't fit in in other ways. And then mm. to top that off, you know, um, from I, I, you know, I've known I'm neurodiverse from a young age. Uh, I got kicked out of school, not because I was uh, aggressive or un un unpleasant. I was just very non-conformative because of the system that I didn't fit in. And then to top it off, I was gay. So all of the mm -hmm. things that just really make you fit into the systems in life. Um, and my story has been very much about extreme inclusion and extreme otherness throughout my journey. And through the acceptance and kindness of people along the way, um, that I've been given the opportunities to show up in different ways to be able to um, have a shot at opportunities that really I probably wouldn't even didn't finish all of my exams so even getting into drama school was based on a kind of access course same with the university um and you know people that just showed me kind of kindness and opportunities that that helped me get to where i needed to be and then you know i've always been really interested in all the other others on this planet like why why do you feel like me am i the same as you like <laughs> That's probably how we we got to know each other, Maz. Absolutely. You're like you're another, and I'm like I, I see, see you. Here. I can see you. <laughs> I see you. You see me. What are we gonna do about that? Um, so, you know, and and I think that you know, my life, I've I've been always interested in development. I've worked and lived in communities all over the world. In fact, I've lived in, um, I think it's 17 cities, seven countries, and two hemispheres. Um, in my life and there's a common theme amongst all of these communities in the world and it's um, you know some people are born into a cumulative uh, affluence and opportunity and some people aren't mm. and the difference really is where you were born and and um, you know access to education and healthcare. so I've worked in Malawi I've, I've been in Sri Lanka I've worked in Malaysia and I think, um, you know, I really felt like a bit of a victim myself until I have worked in some of the communities, which I probably learned the most from in my life, actually. Mm. Um, and that, that kind of put a bit of a fire in my belly around the inequality in this world and yes. resulted in me working for a lot of, for, for the government, private sector and non-for-profit sector in everything from environmental charities to children's cancer charities. I worked at hospice end of life care for a while. Um, and, you know, just, just, just working really hard to try and improve that inequality piece. So I recognize that when I was working for a lot of these non-for-profits and I've helped hundreds and hundreds of businesses build their social responsibility, whether it's staff engagement, brand alignment, whatever that looks like. Mm. And I always recognized the leader that was leading on these things would always be leaning into this agenda in such a passionate, purposeful way. And it would almost be giving them purpose with regards to work. So when I started looking around and thinking, well, what's actually out there for those types of leaders? There was kind of that environmental crowd, which actually, mm. if you're not, not that clued up on, can feel a bit intimidating and a bit overwhelming. And I'm like, yeah. oh, I'm not carrying a keep cup. Am I welcome here? And, you know, all of those things. Is, some of the events, not even any music on in the background. So anyone like me is a bit neurodiverse, just stands there being really freaking <laughs> awkward. Like, I, I want to learn, but my God, can someone help me here? You, you know what I mean? Someone pass me the headphones. So somebody, somebody pass me the headphones and, and one person at a time to speak to me, you know, so that's that's definitely an area and i also looked at well there was also that social responsibility diversity and inclusion crowd which a bit more lights and color and vibrancy but um there was there wasn't really anything out there that wasn't hardcore in this direction or hardcore in that direction and enabling of wherever somebody shows up so if yeah. they show up and they're like well you know i worked for the devil reincarnated yesterday but tomorrow's a perfect day to turn everything around. So, I mean, the only place that we can create an environment like that is through kindness and acceptance mm. and inclusion. And, and that's kind of where the concept for Bambuda came from was like, well, who's actually supporting the leaders on this journey? Because mm. if we can 
um, improve the knowledge, the capacity, the, the confidence and the courage, uh, coupled with the self-awareness of these leaders, I feel like we're onto summit here. And, you know, in doing that, we'll, we'll actually be able to start a ripple effect, which will eventually have an impact. Um, and reason I'm we're sitting in the corporate side of things is because historically we, we look at charities and governments to solve a lot of the world's problems, but actually they don't have the resources to do it. Mm. We've got to we've got to address um, the corporate sector as a as a viable solution to some of the big big problems that we're facing as a global community. So, and that's it. So that's that's Bambuda. That's me in a nutshell. That's my why. Um, I am now and forever committed to reducing inequality um, and that's my life's work. What that looks like into the future, I don't know. Um, but where I'm at now is we've built a movement and I'm super proud of that through hundreds and thousands of collaborators actually. And um, we're ready to start taking real action around how we can empower more and more leaders to become a different kind of leader. A kind leader. A yeah. kind leader. I kind love that. Leader. I love that. And I, I'm going to have to jump on in and let everybody know that that's Anna's attempt to put things into a nutshell. But I, the more that you dive into her impact and her collective's impact and the ripple effect that she speaks to, you will you will very quickly mm. realize there is no nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell. This is extraordinary vision. And it's, it's beyond what I guess I hear the average person is is even daring to dream about let alone start to action mm. and i'm just really curious because a lot of our listeners um obviously are working with younger people um who are who are wanting and they're wanting to help inspire their own imaginations and their own creativity and curiosity what are some of the ways that you connect with that is, is it something tangible that you can describe to other people I think I think that I don't connect. want to be too Whitney Houston about it all, but I really believe the children are the future, you know, of this planet. But we've also got a lot of work to do in this generation now to enable a future for our children. Yeah. Um, and the great thing is, like, when I hear um, teenagers now talking and I'm like, oh, somebody was telling me the other day, they're asking the nephew about what it's like, you know, for gay people at school, for example. And they were like, what do you mean? You know, obviously not in all schools, but certainly in a lot of the inner city schools now, it's like, well, well what do you mean? What's, what's wrong with the gay people? Well, well, as in, do they have it hard? And they're like, well, why would they have it hard? Yeah. Well, um, and f which for me is somebody who has been a fighter in a generation where I, you know, I've got the elders, when I was talking to one of our Amplify uh, uh, participants the other day, who's an elder, 80s, gay champion, you know, around the future that's coming with regards to that inclusion piece. This next generation, I believe, are going to really be fighting for the otherness to be eradicated. And mm. as, a, as a result of that, that sense of pride of otherness, um, that they're, they're going to be more aware of, of the impact and the change they can make in the world than ever. Um, so I'm excited for what the next generation of leaders are going to be doing. Um, I think that we've got to continue listening because I'm already, I'm like 38 and I'm already out of touch with tons of stuff. <laughs> I, I was like, I still think I'm like a cool auntie. You're still but, trendy, Auntie Anna. <laughs> but now I'm like this slightly eccentric auntie that, that moved to Australia and has got quirky <laughs> earrings. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But it's so. funny that you say that because, yes, on the one hand, I, and I agree with you, I mean, the ideas that, that I have the privilege of hearing exploding out of the minds of our young people are just brilliant. And it's mm. that listening piece, isn't it? And to that question of, well, how do we support curiosity? What I'm hearing you say is, well, actually, the curiosity is there. It's more mm. how do we amplify it and how do we give it a voice? Mm. And so then with that in mind and that shared responsibility piece, um, I'm curious about, again, diving back into your personal experience, if you feel comfortable to share, because what I'm hearing a lot of young people reflect, and particularly in the context of this pandemic and the school shutting down and opening up and teachers not knowing necessarily how to help to manage and navigate that because they've got their own boxes to tick. But mm. there's a lot of kids who are saying to the system, you know, really, uh, is how we're learning right now going to be beneficial to us with all of the wicked challenge that we need to be adopting? 
And obviously there are particular markers in terms of education, formal education that we want to help kids move through. So in your mind, having had an experience where obviously you had a very disruptive education mm. by the sound mm. of things, mm. and, and I know that you and I have shared that offline, but where are those learning opportunities if we think a little bit more broadly outside of our traditional classrooms that you could see us in the future taking more advantage of? Well, if I think about like certainly like British education systems that I grew up in, it was kind of post-war and it was built around mm -hmm. fitting into a system that was uh, industrial, revo uh, you know, the industrial um, revolution of, of mm -hmm. you know, you work eight hours a day, you sleep eight hours a day and then you've got eight hours to play, but you never have enough time to actually think about the bigger picture um, mm -hmm. or to be disrupting the status quo because you've had mm -hmm. enough time to think about the bigger picture. So um, I, I think that, that soon and I think very soon um, the education system needs a full reform mm -hmm. that means it can... Um, lean into the skills and the strengths of different different ways of thinking of different types of brains and actually um amplify the voices of this next generation of really really you know i feel like you, we have the indigo children which i think me and you probably are and and this next generation are just like like pfft. I, you know, I don't even, everyone's talking about, oh, millennials, this and millennials, that still. And it's like the millennials are here. <laughs> they're, they're, already, they're already probably your boss. It's actually the next generation are going to blow your socks off. So yeah. we're the first wave in a one. tsunami. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're here as the early messengers to go, uh, <laughs> the lunchbox is <laughs> landing. <laughs> yeah, get ready. You better be ready. Hold on tight. And actually, yeah. and actually, the, the fear associated to change is something yeah. that I think is one of the biggest barriers w that we struggle with. Um, mm -hmm. And until we until we can have more curiosity and a, and a safety for people to be more open minded around what other solutions could look like um, and move away from a well, if it's not broken, why should we try to fix it? You know, and it's well, it's not broken for you, but it is for a lot of other people in the world. Yeah. So. So I think, uh, you know, my personal take on it is that we need to obviously maintain all of the curriculum that is essential. So things like maths and science and English and, you know, languages for communication. But also we need to we need to really, really invest in those other others that think differently because they are the ones that actually change systems and removing creative output removing all of the subjects which create innovative spaces i think is going to be a, a a very very bad move um both from a school level societal level mm -hmm. and organizational level for business as well because that's the space where beautiful things happen mm -hmm. and also that collaborated with the people whose skill sets are in the sciences stem and so on and so forth is is how we find solutions actually so if we all want to be on this planet in a thousand years we need to we need to make sure we're embracing all of the solutions that are available right now and um yeah so that's that's my big waffly random contribution no it's not random at all yeah. to me it's pointing a lot to that that lifelong learning goal and you know both as a friend as a human that sort of attracts me so much to you is that you're constantly mm. asking questions you're constantly working to see the other person's perspective and then working to reshape your perspective and thinking around what's going on for them and how they mm. might be seeing the world differently um you know which is that it's that real empathy piece isn't it but it, i think it's it's moving beyond empathy and into more of the land of curiosity for solution seeking mm. that i'm hearing you speak to that's really exciting and um, yeah, it's funny because I, I, I often have a giggle that we're really, we've moved into a landscape now faster than I think we ever thought we would around flexible work opportunities and flexible career pathways mm. and um, this idea of the four day working week is, is pretty hot. And yet within our schools, 
there's so little flexibility still, even with teachers who are desperately trying to move mountains and can see the creativity. Um, so I think much of what you've spoken to, and that idea of space as well and time is true. Like our kids have had, no wonder they're being disruptive. They have had a lot of time to be sitting around and wondering why the adults are doing things the way they're doing them. You know? But then I suppose, I suppose as well, when I was younger, like whether it was a good upbringing or not, like you had periods of, of intense boredom which yeah. you would fill with creativity and all sorts of whatever you came up with and sometimes I think that the sheer amount of pressure that we have on kids to uh, live up to success the definitions of success that that, yeah. that that society culture and sometimes parents as well as an academic system put on these kids with regards to testing and this that the other I think actually you know, how are we expected to create an equilibrium when we don't, mm. we don't teach children what equilibrium and balance looks like um, in a traditional system? You finish school, extracurricular activities, violin lessons, the get home, the blooming knackered can uh, uh, now what homework, right? It's pretty much bedtime, get up to do it all again in the morning. No wonder yeah. all the kids are anxious by the time they're 15, 16 they haven't had a chance to stop for the last 16 years. <laughs> and then when we get into the workplace, we're like, yeah. how do we deal with this, you know, intensity and bullying and anxieties? It's because no one's ever learned any different. Yeah, and it's through experience as well. I'm hearing the hashtag bring back the boredom. <laughs> yeah, bring back, let's, let's Very it's, loud it's okay for kids to be a bit bored because yeah. actually, it enables them to to make peace with themselves as well, to love themselves. I remember when I was younger, like I would just, and I've always been a bit sleepy, I would just fall asleep everywhere. I remember getting locked into a, a, a fun palace once at lunchtime because I just fell asleep in the ball pool because I was just so bored. I was just laying in this ball pool for so long. I was, <laughs> and I woke up and I'm like, where is everyone? And I'm just in this ball pool. Everyone's gone. And I'm like, all oh, right. So I just help myself to a cook. And then, I, and then I made my way out the fire door. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, like, it's not good parenting. Of course it's not. That I was, like, just nobody even knew where I was and I'm just asleep in a ball pool. But that kind of boredom was something that meant, you know, it started, uh, it started a way of thinking and, and pathways which were built in, in in early enough days for that to have been able to continue i'm not saying that's the right way and there were a lot of mistakes certainly my parents made bringing me up um but it it was it was a, a childhood where anything was possible and mm -hmm. that coupled with lights and color and performance and music and the creative side of stuff um meant i'm always looking for the next production uh, something that's going to make you feel good, a journey, an experience, a um, story that can bring you to a place where it will open interest and curiosity. So, you know, not all kids have that experience. But that power. I'm so glad you went there because I wanted us to get there. And this yeah. is why I did not script with you because I knew we would. I wanted to talk to you about transformation. Okay, yeah. because let me tell you why. I know that a big part of you you've just spoken to is all about the events. It's all about the production. Yep. And you and I, you know, in our early days of friendship, really connected over our, our career history of both going straight into acting school and that yes. genuine love and desire to understand other people and tell their stories and shift imaginations and create a really cool space. And I'm curious about that transformation piece because I wonder how much of it outside of obviously Fortnite, and maybe that's a part of it, but outside of the video gaming world that our kids are getting, mm. in our Western culture, how much space have we got at the moment for transformative experiences for kids? Mm. So in asking that question, I want to flick the microphone over to you in terms of transformative events that you've seen working well and what were the key elements and what do you bring into your events for that purpose to be able to really open somebody else's mind up? Good question. So, so I actually stopped being a performer um, because I got so fascinated by the behind the scenes. So if I'm anything and I'm the best at is I'm a producer. I, I love to produce 
experiences, opportunities, programs, take people on the journey. And it was through an absolute fascination around human behavior, maybe because I was neurodiverse and I didn't fully understand human behavior. Mm. So I would like, why is that person behaving like that? And yes. that's a little bit out of sync with what they've just said. And yes. I, don't, I, don't I don't understand all of this works. And yeah. I think the beautiful thing is a lot of neurodiverse people, and, and I'm happy to be honest about it, I'm dyslexic. I am just going through the final stages of my ADHD autism testing at the moment. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at that to try and find solutions because it, it will help me with my productivity. So that's the main reason I'm going through it. I'm quite comfortable generally in my own skin. But in the mind of a kid like me or people like me, it's like a musical all day mm -hmm. long. All day long. All day long. <laughs> this I literally live so in my head. Also having a musical at the same time. You're like, <laughs> and I'm like, hey, how did you hear about my musical that I, I'm starring in today? Hey there. I wanted to tell you about an exciting and innovative solution we've been designing to help solve this problem of how we best prepare the next gen for an ever-evolving world and future workforce that's going to demand a whole new set of skills and mindsets in order for them to thrive. The POSIFY Academy is Australia's first student-led, evidence-based and curriculum-aligned wellbeing and career development platform, helping young people aged 10 to 14 uncover and deliver their unique potential. It's the first of a trilogy series that's helping young people move seamlessly and with confidence from education and into industry as they design a life and a career of impact. Teaching skills like communication, compassion, creativity, critical thinking, agility, curiosity, resilience, problem solving, all those human capability skills that we talk about here on this podcast and connecting them with a sense of purpose. To learn more, you can visit theposifygroup.com.au forward slash posify dash academy. Now back to the show. So I ended up going into like the lighting box. That's where I started was programming old school lighting boards um, wow. and I was fascinated with well that how we can use sound lighting color changing the environment the sensory environment mm. that that results in different effects and emotions for people yeah and also just around how use of music and all of these different multimedia mediums can help people connect actually with themselves mm -hmm. and with the, each other. So if you can't communicate how you feel, I can always find a song that lets you know how I feel. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. And I, you might be this the big barrister and you've come from a totally different background to me and, and I'm like, in my head, I'm like this traveler kid, or should I even be in this room? And But then we've got a song come on and we make a bit of eye contact and we're like, oh, yeah. Oh, that's part of you, I see. It's, here, here we are. We're yeah. on the same page. We're at the that's same fine. level. And that's yeah. why humor and laughter and the storytelling piece is so important because for that one minute, we're just two seven-year-olds having a good time and and just totally being ourselves in those moments. Mm -hmm. it's, it's disarming. So the power of storytelling is something I've always found really fascinating and something I enjoy as well because it, mm -hmm. I, I remember I used to see so many different performances as a kid that I, there was a period in my life where I actually stopped because a lot of stuff is recycled. So your comedy sets are recycled, different performance sets are recycled and done in different ways, applied to different systems, which we should talk about in a minute. And um, and I really recognised that actually in the end, I was watching the people enjoying the experience for the first time. So I wouldn't wow. necessarily, I know that's a really weird thing to say, but I wouldn't necessarily be watching the performance. I'd be watching somebody else enjoy it and watching the light switch on and, and the conversation and emotion that would come from people as a result of it. So it's not mm -hmm. the main mechanism for me, but it's been an important thing I think I've learned through my life is that if you can't change hearts and minds with the stats and the facts and the figures that the story and the emotional connection to a story is something that can really shift people's mindsets and mm. enable them to relate to people's scenarios issues and things that they might have never ever been able to relate to um and usually it's just about the putting the humanity back into that the story the narrative and 
putting them, using that power of production to put them in a seat of accountability. Mm. So, and there's been producers and directors throughout history that do that really, really well, you know, and and how they use all the different emotions. Like, I don't know, like uh, Quentin Tarantino does it a lot. Not that it's a bit blood and gore for me, but, you know, where he'll use something really extreme followed by comedy. So, or comedy followed by something really extreme. So you are on a journey where you, oh, why, I shouldn't have been laughing. You, you go into that emotional Questioning step. Questioning yourself. Yeah, so, yeah, that power of question. Yes. Mm. So that's why I find production such a powerful tool and, you know, why shouldn't we be able to use production in a corporate environment? Um, oh, why shouldn't absolutely. we in, add joy and laughter, which I believe brings us to a higher state of of um, innovation and acceptance and connection than anything? Um, you know, and yeah, that's pretty much my take on it. I'll just waffle well, on forever me... until you interrupt me, sir. <laughs> Well, let me jump out there yeah. because one of the things that I love about when I'm talking to you is I connect with everything you're saying on a very intuitive level. And yeah. for those of you who, who know me a little bit better, you, you'll know that I have a bit of a laugh at myself and say that I very properly dance between science and spirituality a lot. And I guess that is the science of meaning and purpose is that we're constantly asking those bigger existential questions and have a sense that there's something more than what we're living in this in this kind of, you know, 3D here world. Mm -hmm. um, but let me bring a little bit of science to what Anna was speaking to and yeah. um, the, the common humanity piece. So, so much now this talk about and where I wanted to start the conversation on otherness is because, yes, we flick the light on the strengths and we, we reverse the challenge. And so inclusion has become the hot word. But without that acceptance of actually there is otherness. And so how can we accept that level of otherness and come to the common humanity and find those pieces that sit within us? Um, Stephen Porges's work is around, uh, you know, the nervous systems. Mm -hmm. And I love, you'll love this too, Anna, his, his ideas around, well, if we're looking at neurodiverse kids in our classrooms or adults for that matter in our corporates, and if we're looking at people who have got a trauma background, then rather than thinking about them as those disruptive kids or the naughty kids or the ones who just don't get it, what if we started to consider that actually they're the ones in our classrooms and our workplaces have just got more sensitive nervous systems? Mm. And so how can we tweak our environment, to your point, with that sound, with that music, with that laughter, with those different um, human-connected experiences that go way back before we had all of our rats and stats and bats and cats and we were telling stories around a fireplace? Mm. What would that do? You know, how, what conversations would that open? Would there have to be verbal conversations? Is there a way of speaking with one another that is more about that, that, that connection, that I see you? And because when we see one another, we want to learn more about one another and it activates the parts of our brain that are moving towards. Um, and you spoke also about that. Yeah, well, you've got the music and then the joy and then the laughter. And so it opens something up. And we know from Barbara Fredrickson's work around you, that we've got that upward spiral of positive energy. So you have one positive experience and it loads on top of itself. And so what happens when you've got somebody orchestrating that like you do so well in all of your events? But where's the intentionality is, mm. is the call to action I'm hearing from you? You know, mm. how can we all have a shared responsibility of being more mindful and coming at a space with that with that curiosity and that sense of beginner's mind and you know who am I meeting in the room and being mindful that we don't know their backstory mm. and so what are the elements that we can come together um, so yeah I, I love so much of what you speak to through your own lived experiences and uh, that you've that you have learned through sheer waking up every day yeah and, and it's not even the science i'm not from the science you no. were the left side of the brain i'd always been looking for weren't you maz when we met <laughs> <laughs> I was like, friend, the more we hang out i'm like the left it's going it's going it's going yeah. bring it back bring it back <laughs> yeah and, and i'm like i just do this and you're like but there's loads of science around that you know and i'm like okay tell me about the science and I, and you know that's another thing is like you know it's it's lived experience so that's my yeah. proof in the pudding it feels yeah. right it works and it is the right thing to do is to create these inclusive spaces but we've got a beautiful team now because of the foundations you help us build where you know we've got a programs team and we've got some great contributors that are helping us with some very exciting stuff we're launching soon um to to be able to really create something special that businesses and leaders can 
can connect with from a program perspective. So, yeah, it's it's definitely a really good mechanism for yeah getting everybody on on a journey. Yeah, and I always think with the sciences, it, sometimes it's just a translator piece, isn't it? It's uh, to your point of, of the system, you know, what someone's cultural yeah. background, what are they used to hearing? What's the language that they're familiar with? You know, what are those familiar patterns in their minds that, that you can start with? And then once you've got that starting point, it comes down to intention, doesn't it? And, and I think it's not about like having this fake happiness all the time. Like mm. it's okay to to be human and to have lots of feelings and stop it i can't believe you've gone there too i was going to talk yeah to and i know we're running out of time but have we got a moment because yes. you've just got this beautiful view on what it means to be authentic and how you spot that in others can you tell me a little bit because it taps into more of that gut feeling doesn't it tell me yeah. a little bit about authenticity and what it means like for you and intuition and how those two things collide so it's just it, it, it i think it's just i you know i'm not like happy and super kind all the time like i'm just a normal human sometimes i wake up and i don't feel that confident that day or you know i'll, I'll t take an action that i regret or you know and, and and i think that that consistently just for me it's about leaving your ego at the door and if you can just be open to feedback, even if it's not comfortable from all of the people around you, you can just continue to show up each day as a better version of yourself, the best version of yourself you can be. But also for somebody who's neurodiverse and, and certainly things like ADHD and autism often present differently in women, mm. which you'll know about because you're, you're one of these brainiacs that's all about the science. Also um, the ADHD, so yeah, you know, a bit differently for me too. <laughs> so, so you know that people think, oh, you, you can't read body language, and you, yeah. you know, you might not pick up on social cues or systems. And oh, by and by the way, I miss. Oh, I miss not them. empathetic either. By the way, yeah, There's no, no emotion. No, you know, but oh. actually, people I know that are neurodiverse yeah. are deeply affected by Very the things so. around them, and um you know i do miss a social qr too um and i'm happy to admit that but also it just is what it is and but you can i can physically feel the emotions of people around me mm -hmm. it, i feel it and so they might not even know sometimes how they've mm -hmm. shown up that i'm like oh something's not right for that person today the old me would would very you know probably unconsiderately with the intention of trying to improve their situation, say, are you feeling like this? <laughs> <laughs> because it feels like you're feeling like this. <laughs> what can I do I to improve you for explaining that? that to other people? That is just oh my goodness you have yeah. just summed up so, such a common experience and i work with a lot of quirky kids and i see this in action that's why i get so frustrated with that lack of understanding that autism in particular and neurodiversity in particular in general there is a spectrum of people's experiences and i think that where we've got a little bit confused around this piece of empathy it's very different from the empathy is i i feel and i can i can see your other emotion i think where the difficulty is then not knowing what to do with it not knowing where to place it so mm. what i hear a lot from neurodiverse kids and we know in the literature is that they find it difficult to understand well how much of this is mine and how much of this is yours and what's my responsibility and what do i do with it yes whereas for um, a neurotypical person they can recognize that emotion as being yours and they might check in but then they're like well that's your responsibility i've done my part right and so it's not <laughs> yeah well I'll, well i'll be like oh gosh um, this is this is, must be my responsibility now. But the old the old me would be like, "Is this how you're feeling? What can I do?" And they're like, "Oh my god, don't bring to life how I'm feeling. I'm not in the mood <laughs> to, to to let the lid fall off right now. I just asked you if you wanted a cup of tea." Um, and, but now now that the, the having learned more about the way I operate, I think to myself, "Oh, I have a feeling they're feeling like this." Yes. So my options are in. to, I can take other actions and behaviours which might make them feel better without me needing to point it out. So I'm, I'm getting much better at that. And also, you know, remembering on those days where if you, for me, I speak to hundreds of people probably a week, you know, that you come home and you think, oh God, what is all of this strange energy I've got going on? Or I'm mm -hmm. feeling, I feel suddenly emotional. It's not me. I've just taken on a lot 
for that day and I'm getting better. Certainly you've helped me with that as well, man's getting better at those boundaries and knowing what you can and can't control and when you should and shouldn't step in. Um, well, likewise, I think you've done the same for me, my friend. It's yeah. been an absolute joy and a, a privilege to have been spotted by somebody else and, and vice versa. And that's really what we're here for, isn't it? It's just to be kind mm. to one another and to recognize that we're all on a funny little journey, this journey of human existence. And so if we Is it too late to, to talk about another? systems? Have we got enough time no, to talk about systems? No, go for it. So, yeah. Um, so I, and another thing that I think is really important, because I'm going to link this obviously into system change, which is mm. something that we're committed to. The reason we spend time and we're focusing on the leadership piece is because we know if leaders are empowered with their sense of self, their sphere of influence, the tools, yeah. resources and the knowledge that they will change automatically start changing their sphere of influence and the people they can influence around them which will change systems mm. and also you know around the system connections and everything i think one of the things that certainly is a superpower i think and there's a little bit of controversy using the term superpower in neurodiverse world i'm aware but i feel like it's a superpower for me is is ability to see systems mm. and see the gaps in a system and the patterns as and well. the patterns so and actually, I believe there's not that many systems on this planet. It's just hmm. all in different environments. So, for example, how do I learn that? How do I learn to fit in? Oh, I've recognized through observation that if I behave in this way, this way, this way, and follow it up with trust and certain behaviors, that makes you likable, you know? Hmm. So that's a system. And if I can learn that system as somebody who's neurodiverse, how do I apply that system? In a, in a teaching environment, in an environment where we can empower the people to understand how to utilize the system or fit into it. But also around, the, you know, everything is, is absolutely connected in one way, shape or form. Like some people will say, well, why, if your kindness to environment is important to you, why are you just focusing on the diversity and inclusion? And a lot mm. of people don't know that actually one of the biggest ways we can reduce CO2 on this planet is by educating women and girls. You know, because it's got a direct correlation with the most of the people working on the ground and so on and so forth are women around the world. Mm, so absolutely. so the, 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 the systems that connect everything, I think, is such an important thing and actually quite fascinating when you get into it. And people, if we're sticking on that neurodiverse thing, I, I do find neurodiverse people are often really, really good at spotting systems and the gaps within systems. Or for me, sometimes I'm like, oh, this fits somewhere. I don't mm. know where yet. But and that's very hard as a, as a social entrepreneur to communicate sometimes because yes. they're like, but why, Anna? What's the why? Where does this fit? And I'm sometimes I'm like, I don't know yet. Yeah, but give me, me 12 months. It. There's a method me, behind my yeah, madness. Yes, yes. And and that's quite Let me bring you the proof. How can I how can I show you the evidence yeah. when I can't play first? <laughs> yeah, so sometimes the way things are designed from that perspective yeah. is almost like I know this fits, but I work backwards from there. Yeah, and that's engineer. intrinsic. Yes. So so how do you how do you create a, a how do you create a framework? around certain levels of intrinsic behaviors in leaders and humans that just just know that fits somehow um yeah. so that's another thing that's quite fascinating and, and i always say that you need a translator so if yeah. you're built like me and you're like oh that fits don't know where it fits don't even tell anyone yet <laughs> don't tell anyone because they're going to be like <laughs> you nutter be careful about how, who you tell. Yeah. Be, be very conscious about who yeah, you Yeah, and tell. they're like, <laughs> so you need to translate somebody that, that's going to understand the, the fact, the system that you're plotting mm. out. Like it's like a, like stars in the sky, you know, it's, it's a constellation. And yeah. you're looking at the constellation and saying, okay, that fits, that fits, that, that fits. And then you go to someone, does this make sense? And they're like, no. And you're like, God's sake, go back again. Okay what's missing yeah and then so i remember when i first started bambuda i would be asking bus drivers i'd be like this is what i do does this make sense <laughs> <laughs> i was like for like two years like chandler off friends everyone was like oh anna's doing this like awesome stuff and do you, what does she do and uh, <laughs> something <laughs> kindness um kindness in business 
So, so being able to, it's all good and well having the systems and, and being able to see the systems and mapping out your constellation, but you need translators and people that are going to be brutally honest with you mm. to help you put that into a system that is acceptable, understandable and empowering for other people to engage with. And I'd say that's been my biggest lesson on this journey is, is actually you need a translator and multiple translators to help make sure it's communicatable to the masses. Can, can I have a go then? Can I have a go yeah. at translating? I, I, th I think I'm getting to know my community. And so I may be overstepping here, but let me, let me check in because when I think of systems, traditionally speaking, and, and sort of what we talk about in the literature, it's more around, you might go, you, your industry system, or your education system, or your health system. Mm. And so um, what I heard you speak to is more around, and again, that's superpower, if you like, but pattern recognition. Yes. And so where is the system in that pattern recognition? And once you've got that skill set, if you like, and I do believe it is one that can be taught, and we teach it at the Posify group, mm. once you've got that pattern recognition, how can then you take it and rather than spotting problems, see, okay, where are those gaps and where are the opportunities? And mm. how can I take the system pattern recognition that I've seen over here and apply it to this environmental situation? Am I kind of on the right track? 100%. So, okay. so okay. every conversation I have, I will, I will think about how does this fit into this, this environment? And yeah. it could be that it doesn't right now, but it doesn't mean it wouldn't in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I think that's the creative piece that comes with it is somebody comes with, I am offering this and then you go, okay, let's look at this through this system. Let's look at this through the outcomes we're trying to achieve or the impact we're trying to achieve. And actually yeah. this could be something that fits into this, but we just haven't seen it as part of that system yet. We haven't tried it before. Yeah. And so the other thing that I'm hearing you speak to is that concept of cognitive flexibility which, you know, there's a lot of talk about, well, we want our next gen to be creative and we want them to be innovative and we want them to be agile and nimble and to be able to pivot and twist. And yet we need to also, for people who haven't got that neurodiverse, natural intrinsic pattern seeking recognition superpower, as you put it, we need to show them a little bit of a roadmap of what it is like to rather than start with, I'll give you a clear example. Yeah. I had a, a conversation just yesterday that actually blew my mind with a young person who was saying that they really wanted to travel, that they were really desperately saddened by COVID because it was trapping them here. And I was mm. like, okay, well, everything's opening back up again. Where do you want to go? Oh, I can't go anywhere. Okay. Um, interesting place to start. Curious. Where's the can't come from? Well, because everywhere's too expensive. Ah, oh, okay. So now I'm seeing that rigid thinking pattern going on. Mm. Let's ask a bigger question. If money wasn't an issue, where would you go? But money is an issue right? So somehow we have caught our kids up in a way of learning that starts with where the problem is and stops there. Mm -hmm. And so what does it look like to educate a young person or to introduce them to different ways of thinking where let's remove all of the barriers just mentally and play for a minute. So in mm -hmm. design thinking, we talk about flaring out, let's not have judgment, let's have open brainstorming and any idea is a great idea. And mm -hmm. what if there weren't those barriers, then what might be possible? Um, and what I love about what you do and what so many of the social entrepreneurs and people in the Bambuda community are doing, and, and I hope ourselves at Positify Group is, is actually daring to ask those bigger questions and then having some faith and some trust in not just our own process, but the fact that other people will support us, that as we are being disruptive and we don't necessarily know where it's going but there is a trust piece because we mm. will get feedback and we will be able to do different things based on that feedback and i think if we're all following a do no harm policy and to your point being kind why wouldn't we try things differently mm. it just makes sense and you're the ceo of your own destiny in your own life you know and i think that that's what we're trying to create at bambuda is not a you know like yes i'm the founder but actually the leader is yourself and how you yeah. engage with it yourself. And, you know, there's not one cookie cutter approach. It's how you apply it to your environments and that, that you can be that game changer. You're the leader. And I always say that we're on base and, you know, we're not here to be lead guitarists. We're on base. We don't mm -hmm. know where we're going sometimes, but we're just jamming. And that, you know, <laughs> in the end, maybe we'll make a bloody beautiful, a beautiful song. And, um, and, and, you oh, know, yeah just by doing that we've managed to build amazing programs amazing frameworks a great engagement and 
you know, a community of people that are, are actually like minded and committed to reducing inequality and actually create an impact. And and I'm proud of that, but not not because, you know, I'm the founder. I'm proud of that because it's fundamentally, intrinsically my purpose. So it's it's and and to see other people find their purpose and be able to lean into that, mm. that's that's transformation and it's beautiful to watch like next level beautiful to watch and even more beautiful once the impact starts happening and sometimes I hear the stories of what people have been doing and I'm like oh my gosh like yeah we 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 were just the catalyst to get them to what they needed to to be so that they could create this freaking impact and like I love being the shepherd somebody told me I can't remember it was uh that there is is no coincidence between your last name your name and what you become and you're Marianne Power you're powerful you know with regards to your jurisdiction and your intention and I'm on a shepherd my job is to walk beside people from here to here and that's that's a uh, a name that I'm really proud to hold is is my last name, Shepherd, and and I really don't mean to be biblical about it because I'm not particularly religious in any way, um, but I I certainly think that there's something to that. Um, or it's a massive, massive coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so either way, I'm open to it. <laughs> it. It's a really good story anyway, and we're going to hold on to that story. Yeah. And on that piece, that's a beautiful, beautiful place to end. But before we do, because we have gone in a very lived experience through so much of what I hoped we would today, that idea of what is an integrated identity and what do we mean when we're talking to authenticity and transformation and how does all this relate to helping our kids think a little bit differently and learn in a new way as, they, as we move into this ever-changing world. But before we go, mm. can we play a little game? And yeah. You, you're asking me this, so it's so fun to spin I, it around. I would love to play a game. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. It's a very short one because okay. you've been so generous with your time. It's just a sim simple sentence STEM activity that anybody can do wherever they are, whoever they're with. And the simple sentence STEM question I am going to ask you is, what will you put at the end of, wouldn't it be amazing if? We could embrace our differences. I love that. Thank you, Anna Shepherd. Thank we'll you, Marianne Powell. Alongside you. You have been listening to Classroom 5.0 with Anna Shepherd, who is not just the founder of Bambuda. She is one of my very best friends, and it has been an absolute privilege to hear her speak to all of her story and all of her wild dreams and to be along that journey with her. If you want to check out more about Anna and, of course, subscribe to this podcast, grab yourself your free fun sheet that you can take into wherever your learning space is. You can visit our episode page. Until next time, we will be seeing you later, alligators. Classroom 5.0 is brought to you by the Posify Group, a socially conscious education company arming the next gen with a sense of purpose and the future skills they'll need to thrive in this ever evolving world. Your ratings and reviews really mean the world to us. So if you loved this episode, do let us know and share it with a friend. We'd like to say thanks to our editing guru, Clint Rance, and his team at My Video Producer, who helped us put this show together. And for today's show notes, links, and more episodes just like these, you can visit theposifygroup.com.au forward slash podcast. Thanks for helping us imagine alive the future of learning. See you next time.